so I don't know where all of you are with your moms, but um, we all have a mom somehow, some way, somewhere. And uh, the ultimate mom, in my opinion, is like the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's like like the perfect mom, you know. And so I, I really like to honor the Holy Spirit on Mother's Day, personally. Um, good mom. But uh, I had a good mom too in the flesh. My my natural mom was good. Um, she she no longer has her body on the earth, but but I honor her and the life that she had and how much she loved us children and, and gave to us. And I mean, if, if you just think about um, for those of us who had mothers in the house and you know those that poured into us and stuff, man. Um, one of the things I've come to realize is that being a mom is probably the, in our culture at least, the most uh, undervalued, under celebrated, under appreciated, uh, and most difficult job there yeah. is, um, because there's no like regular breaks. There's no respite. respite. There's no respite. You know, it's just twenty four seven. You know. Um, and and they're they're so much un, they're they're the unsung hero constantly. They never get rep, they never get recognition. You know they're always like uh, lifting up their husband or their children. Holy Spirit does the same thing, right? We, like Holy Spirit is like you you help me, you empower me, you you know. The Holy Spirit is just lifting up Jesus, just lifting up the Father, just giving us understanding, yeah. but never trying to get attention. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, and moms are like that. Like a a, a good mom is is. Um, uh, such a glorious, incredible, godly thing. And uh, so tomorrow, take take time to honor your moms as you're able, wherever you're at. Um, help If you have children, help your children honor uh, their mom. Um, and uh, honor Holy Spirit tomorrow. Because um, God is a family, and we're made just like them. So, amen? Amen. Okay. Thanks. All right. Let's see. We, sh- right before we got here, Shania took my phone and called 911 <laughs> and locked my phone out. I, it still says notification canceled and I cannot reset it. I can't like force it off. It's, it just has to die. I think the, uh, the battery has to die. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. All right, let's pray. Yeah. Um, Father, thank you for your body the body of your son, um, the fellowship of your spirit, the infilling of your spirit. Thank you that you teach us, Lord. Um, All of us are here to be taught by you, to be fed by you, to be encouraged by you. And we acknowledge right now that you live in each one of us. And so we value and honor each other and every member of this body as we honor you. We honor you right now as we listen, as we participate, as we uh, commune, as we hold our hearts open to you. And we say, Lord, what, what you want to release tonight, do it. Yeah. Release it. Um, transform us. Change us into your image all the more so that those that look upon us would see you. And so that when we look in the mirror, we see you. I thank you that you've already finished the work. Um, you brought us into rest, and, and we want to stay there. We want to we wanna strive to enter that rest, not strive any other way. And so... Um, come and teach us, Lord. We need you. We, we let go of as much as we're able right now. Everything we think we know, just let it go. And we say, come and fill us. Come and fill us in all the places where we are empty, where we are weak, where we need grace and truth. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, so... I, um... We... There, there's so much that comes out of um, spending time together with um, Kirby and Fiona, yeah, and a, and a 5DP that it's 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 kind of overwhelming, you know. You're like, oh my gosh, you come back and you're like, uh, what do we do now, you know? Um, which is why we're all going to share in different parts of the body. The best way to to move on um, from times like that is just to be together, you know, spend time together, um, share with one another what's going on. Paul says in um, one of my favorite verses for the church is um, 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 26 or something like that. It says when you come together, everybody has something. You know, someone has a tongue. Somebody has a lesson, a revelation, a teaching, an interpretation. Um, but when you come together, like share what you all have because everyone here is a gift. You know, we, we're, 
we're kind of still in a pattern of um, this form, you know, where we meet together and we sing and, and then like uh, a few people will teach and stuff. But um, if you would imagine during the time of the, the apostles and disciples, what it looked like when they got together, um, there's a problem. There was probably a lot of participation. Yeah. You know, a lot of like people standing up and giving and different people teaching and all kinds of stuff like that. So we, we want to work back towards that more and more. Um, and I, I, I mean, I don't know if you guys, how much you're aware of this, but I mean, the church is changing on a massive global scale right now. Um, most of the religious institutional churches that gather are being shaken apart. Right. We're a unique church in that um, most of us here are not here like a normal church goer. Um, in fact, I don't know if I know anybody here like that. Um, but the churches that are here and get together institutionally and religiously are being obliterated right now across the face of the earth. Um, Jesus is so real that he he goes beyond the Sunday or the Saturday that right. we meet, right? He right. he's he's so real that he changes your household. Yeah. yeah. He changes your workplace. He changes your drives yeah. when you're driving around. He changes when you shop at the store. He's so real that it doesn't it's not even in like a, a thought anymore after you start living in his life that you need to go to church. It's just something you want to do because you're the church. Yeah. You know? You like you're the body. You're like, oh, I am not connected to the body right now, and I feel like something is off. You know, you want to be connected because you're a member of the body. Um, and if you're not connected, you will feel disconnected, and you will feel a lack of life. Yeah. Um, and so it's good to get together. We strengthen each other. We build each other up in love. The whole goal of getting together is to build each other up in love. And so um, that is that's what we want to do. Um all right. Well, oh, let's see if I can get this here. Today is the eighth. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> My uh, the ninth. So, you guys have heard me talk about grace. Um, it's one of my favorite subjects. I don't like to call this subject because. It's more than a subject, you know, it's, it's like part of the core essence of who God is and what he's like, you know, he's graceful. Um, wow, my computer's wigging out, it's funny. Um, I want to go over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if you guys want to follow along, pull it up in your phone or on your paper Bible. <laughs> Anybody have a paper Bible anymore here? Yes, I'm talking about it. <laughs> Two of us, three of us did. I got one too. Where are we going? First Corinthians, chapter one. Um, a few weeks ago, I I was encouraging all of us in grace um, in Romans one sixteen, right? The the gospel is the power of God for salvation. That that verse. Um, and one of the things I was reminding us of is is that. It's not some other external teaching that's amazing about God. That's the power for salvation, but it's the gospel. That's the power of God for salvation. And, and it's the gospel meets you in your weakness. And that's the amazing thing about it. You know, because we all here on earth are constantly confronted with our weaknesses and our failures. Um, when we're confronted with failures, we immediately are confronted with judgment, condemnation, accusation, guilt, and it's usually like there, there's a measure of truth that's right to confront us because we're in the wrong. We've done something wrong, and therefore the balances and the scales need to be righted. And in and, and our heart, we're like, oh, okay, yep. Yeah. And then we brace ourselves, and however we defend ourselves or however we let Jesus defend us, right? Yeah. Um, well, The, the beauty and the glory of, of the gospel is, like, that's the sweet spot, you know? That's why humility is so key in the kingdom. Because when, when you humble yourself, and that's what every Christian is invited to do. God doesn't want to ever have to humble a Christian. 
The invitation is to humble yourself. That's a powerful choice. To humble yourself. When Jesus humbled himself. The Father didn't have to humble him. Um, and he could have, right? He, he was God. Came as a man. He could have done anything, but he chose to humble himself all the way to the point of being naked and dying on a cross. When, when you live in humility and you choose to humble yourself on a daily basis, in a moment-by-moment moment basis, you will continually find yourself in these situations where you confront your failures and your weaknesses. And I'm telling you, that's a sweet spot. This is where the power of God will rest on your life and will save you, deliver you, heal you, prosper you, set you free. What we do in the world and when we act like mere men is we don't listen to humility and we try to find ways out of our weakness by our own strength. We try to find self-justifications for our own failures and we try to run away or hide these areas. Because these, they're scary, and our heart is vulnerable in these areas, you know. Um, <clears throat> and in our whole life, we're searching for ways to cover ourselves and to right these wrongs and to fix these things. And uh, I don't know about, about you guys, but as I, as I live and as I walk in this earth as a believer, I am constantly tempted to walk away from grace and to think that I still got it. Um, I'm constantly tempted to think that um, I already got the revelation of Jesus. I already know that his righteousness is for me. And I'm righteous because he's righteous. So I don't really need to meditate on that anymore. I need to start looking for new things. I constantly get tempted in that. Um, but those other things are not the power of God to save you, to, to make you fully formed to look just like Jesus, to mature you into that place where you're just in rest walking as Jesus walked, you know? Um, all of us here are on, on some level of maturity walking in Christ, you know? And um, most of us don't see spiritually exactly how mature or immature we are, but um, I think we would be amazed if we did, you know? And we'd probably give each other a lot more grace if we saw how infantile some of us are, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way, I mean it in a sobering way. <laughs> yeah. Some of us are really young babies in the faith. And that's, uh, you, you can't get mad at a baby for being a baby. <laughs> I can't get mad at a five-year-old for being a five-year-old, a 10-year-old for being a 10-year-old, you know what I mean? Yeah. The, the faith is like this. In the spirit, you are, you're growing up into him. Um, but your maturity really depends on how you hear how you're hearing from God, how you're hearing the word, how you're letting him cleanse you, how you are choosing humility or not choosing humility, that the more you humble yourself, the more you will mature. He'll do it because when you humble yourself, you're just gonna, you're gonna see him and he's gonna change you. He's gonna meet you in your weakness. Yeah. Um, I like to differentiate between mercy and grace. And uh, I, I see mercy as him coming and re- like bringing justice to a to a mistake, to an error, to a wrongdoing, to a sin. Some, you know what I mean? Like mercy when you deserved judgment because you did something wrong. Like I see that as mercy. Um, it, it's what brings rest to your soul. It brings peace to your conscience that's hardened or violated, or you know that you're not listening to the Lord. You know you're being rebellious. You re- like that, and that when you receive mercy, it brings you in fear and trembling to His presence. To his throne of grace, and then all this, and he wants to give you more, right? Which is incredible. That that's where I really see the fear and trembling um, taking effect in our lives. We we come, we receive mercy when we should receive judgment, right? But Jesus took the judgment, and so we can receive mercy, and mercy triumphs over that judgment, right? Because the goodness of God is it's way up here, right? It's much higher than the floor of justice, right? Righteousness and justice is the floor of His throne, but up here is all this goodness, it's all this glory, it's it's the Father's heart, you know? But the foundation is justice, and so it has to be fair, has to be paid. So when there's errors and mistakes and failures and sins, that has to be dealt with, but he dealt with it. And so the only way to come out of that is through mercy, 
receive the, the blood, the washing, the cleansing of your conscience, brings you back to innocence, brings you back to peace. Now you can walk in peace, and the God of peace crushes Satan under your feet, right? Yeah. Is you walking in peace because the blood has swept away all the accusations, all the judgments, all the guilt, all the shame, it's, the shame is gone, right? But then, beyond that, grace. Grace supernaturally empowers us to walk just like Jesus walked, to live just like Jesus lived, to think just like Jesus thought. Yeah. This is what grace does. This is what happens when we see a weakness, not a failure, but a weakness, and we come to God with it, with an open heart, a true heart, and we don't try to hide our weaknesses, we don't try to justify our weaknesses, we just see, like, wow, I'm really immature or weak in this area. And you're just open with the Lord in it. And a lot of times what being open with the Lord looks like is being open with those around you who are trustworthy. I don't mean just go, you know, share with everybody, but those that you know are trustworthy, yeah. you can share your weaknesses with them. Yeah. He who can't love his neighbor that he sees can't love God whom he doesn't see, right? That whole concept is very telling and how transparent you are with the Lord. If you don't trust your neighbor, your brother, your sister, your husband, your wife, wow. with things that are hard in your heart, you know, with those that you see, how can you, with God, you don't see? Right. There's there's a thing there. Yeah, that's good. Um, I'm not obligating everybody to go share everything, you understand. I'm just saying there's something there yeah. to be mined out with, this, with the Holy Spirit in your relationships. Um, so grace... Grace comes to you as you're weak, as you're empty, as you let go of what you think you know or how strong you think you are or you stop hiding and, and defending yourself in areas where you know you're weak. Um, okay, before we get into 1 Corinthians, I, I want to I wanna capitalize on the weakness thing real quick and where Paul talks about it because it's so good and it's so refreshing. Um, I think it's 2 Corinthians 10 and 11. is me without a phone functioning and a computer working. It's funny. All right, Lord. Where is it? Uh, it must be, maybe it's 1 Corinthians 10, 11, 12. Let's see. Hmm. What are you looking for? What scripture? Uh, power and weakness. I think I think it is the end of two Corinthians. Um, maybe I'll keep that as an option. Here it is. Take pleasure and approach it. Yeah, I found it. Thank two, you. What is it? Um, two Corinthians twelve. Yeah, okay. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, 10. Thanks for your patience. Um, so Paul's talking about his thorn in the flesh and um, weaknesses that he encounters. And uh, it's always worth pointing out, you know, that Paul, Paul was out of his mind for God on a regular basis. You know, uh, what he did, he did because he was out of his mind. Mm -hmm. He just, he, that, that ex expresses his life. You know, God, I was, I was scratching my head when I saw, you know, Ananias, the guy who um, they, God sent Paul to, and then he healed him, you know, and Ananias says, God show me how much you will suffer for me, you know. And before I knew the goodness of God to the degree I know, I still got a lot more to learn about his goodness. But before I knew that, I, I thought, man, Lord. That's, that's intense, you know, you're just like, you're just going to show them how much you're going to suffer for you, you know. But then I, I realized that Paul wanted that, you know. Paul was like, 
He just wanted to suffer for love's sake. He, he wanted to join Jesus in his suffering because he knew the suffering of Jesus was love suffering. You know, he saw the value and the worth of everybody. And he's like, man, it's, I don't care. I'll give up everything. I'll be beaten. I'll be whipped. I'll be scourged. I'll be left for dead. I'll be treated like, you know, it, he, like this was Paul. Now, Paul, obviously, he was not like Peter, James, John, and all the rest, walking with Jesus for three years, right? He, he met him after he had a, an, an appearing, got knocked off his horse, his high horse, if you will. Um, and the blindness in Paul's heart was revealed, right, in the light of Christ. That's what happens when the light of God comes on you. What is really inwardly real for you will become revealed externally. And Paul... I used to think that God made Paul blind too. And then I realized, no, he was just revealing Paul's condition spiritually and it manifested yeah. because he was totally blind inwardly, you know, persecuting the church, hating God against Jesus, the very thing he wanted, you know, um, to champion. He was blind to and he couldn't because of self-righteousness. But Paul um, Paul ends up doing so much, right? He travels the world. He, he preaches to all these different cultures. He starts all these incredible churches, and we, we're still talking about him constantly today, but he says constantly, like, how did I do this? You know? Um, he didn't do it by um, superior organizational administrative skills. <laughs> he didn't do it because he had some admin assistant scheduling him and booking him out, you know, Monday through Friday for three years to come, you know? He did it by the grace of God. Yeah. And it was supernatural. Yeah. Well, <sighs> This, this grace, and he says constantly, his great, God's grace towards me is not in vain, meaning I, I let it work through me. I, yeah, I, yeah. I, and this is his secret. This is why I want to go back here and why I love to go back here. Second Corinthians um, 12, 8. Concerning the thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. So something was troubling Paul so much that he was like, God, please take this away from me. It's just like too much to bear. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect or mature in weakness. And then Paul responds, therefore, okay. <laughs> he told me that. Here's my response. I will now most gladly, instead of asking God to take these weaknesses away, Amen. I will boast in them. That... If you guys have any apps where you can like study the words and stuff, I would go in here and like study these words, meditate on this. This is powerful, life-changing stuff. My strength, so I will gladly boast rather in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest on me. Continuing, therefore, I take pleasure in weaknesses. This is a mind very different than a mere human mind. I know that we all say we're human to just, you know, say, well, we made mistakes or whatever. Okay, fair. However, is it really fair? Right. I think Paul would challenge that. Yeah, I think so too. I think you'd be like, you're acting like a mere human. Right. Like he says to the Corinthians. <laughs> I don't think that's a legitimate excuse. Yeah. I think when we make mistakes, we just need to receive mercy. Yeah. And we need to go find grace. And I think we need to humble ourselves and let his grace come rest on us, you know? That's different than, well, I'm human, you know? Like, and let's not do that to each other. Right. That's not nice. Well, maybe it is nice, but you don't want nice. Yeah. You want loving. You want encouraging. You don't want flattery. Yeah. You want encouraging. Yeah. Encouragement and flattery are very different. <clears throat> right? Yeah. That's so good, Bo. I take pleasure in my weaknesses, in reproaches. I take pleasure in my needs. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> the enemy will try to, yeah, amen. <laughs> I take pleasure in my persecutions. I take pleasure in my distresses. When I'm frustrated, when I'm out of options, when I feel like everything's gone wrong, Paul is saying, I take pleasure in that. Okay, this is a very different mindset. This can be your mindset. Yeah. 
um, this could be my mindset, that we have now the mind of Christ, right? This, this is a yeah. true scriptural truth that we must grow in. Um, we have the mind of Christ. Jesus thinks this way. In the kingdom of God, less equals more. It's not the opposite, but we need to keep reminding ourselves and each other that that is true. Less equals more. It's uncomfortable when we run out of stuff or time or resources or ability to do something, but when we bring those weaknesses to each other unto God, man, the power of Jesus rests on us. Grace comes through and performs for us, delivers for us, changes us. We get transformed this way. This is, you know, you come and you, I mean, a heart posture is like, I, you're humble, so you're not justifying yourself, and you know that you need something, right, in your heart, and you just, you come to him, and however that looks, whether you're talking to friends or family or just God by yourself, or, or you're looking in the mirror and you're like, wow, I got nothing, you know? Um, you're confronting weakness, and you're saying, I need your grace. I, I can't do this. But I, I'm not... I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to run away, away from the confrontation, the things that confront my weaknesses, right? Because yeah. that's not, the, the righteous don't shrink back. Yeah. Right. You confront these things where, that are confronting your weaknesses, but you confront them with Christ. Amen. And that's a big deal. Because we can all run away and pretend like we're boasting our weaknesses, but we're not confronting them and letting Jesus show up. We have to let Jesus show up by confronting those areas that draw out the weaknesses. Paul did that. He did it a lot. Um, and I do say every one of us can find these areas every day in our life. You know, um, you don't have to. You don't have to look far. And they're right in front of your nose. Um, and he he wants to he wants to be grace for you and change you and transform you. And the, the more, I mean. We grow and mature in areas, you know, where we receive grace. And after a while of receiving grace repeatedly in an area, you actually grow into and are formed by his grace. And you actually get good at said area. But man, you know it's his grace. Yeah. You know? And, and, and therefore, you're humble and you're safe in that area. Yeah. Right? I, I've said this before, but the dangerous part is where you already know you're strong and your strengths. Because you're very tempted to think that you don't need grace. Or that those strengths didn't come to you by pure grace. That's good, I'm good at whatever, you know. It's all, oh, every good gift. Paul says something like, you know, it, every good thing you've received, you've received. How do you act like you didn't receive it? How are you pretending like you got this somehow in a way that makes you better than somebody else? Like, comparisons doesn't make any sense in the kingdom. Because we acknowledge there's a Father who gives good gifts to all. Yeah. And every good thing we all have is a gift. You know? So, living by grace is so refreshing. It's so empowering. It's so restful. It's so easy. You know? But it requires living in that place where you are not justifying yourself. You are not running away from your weaknesses or your failures. You are confronting them. Amen. And then you're requiring God's help daily. Which... It really is its relationship you know it's <laughs> the um, it's, I think a lot of times we call it in the church a process <laughs> where we say I'm in the process of whatever you yeah, know yeah. you're explaining an ongoing issue you may have um, but God wants to call that relationship yeah that's you know better. he wants to walk with you and he wants to be grace for you you know he wants to bring you mercy where you're still believing lies because that's why we do the things we need mercy for because we're believing lies, we're not in the faith. Um, anyways. It is a process when you're not doing it with him. Versus a relationship. Yeah. Yeah, Nora said it, it is a process when you're not doing it with him. Um, but when you're doing it with him, and, and the way to do it with him is you just look up, look to him, you know, talk to him, listen for him. That's how you do it with him. Whatever you're doing, just do it with him. It, we can make all the mistakes in the world as long as we're doing it with him. You know, we'll eventually learn how to walk, how to run, how to fly when we do it with him. 
All right, back to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Sounds like fireworks in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. I'm going to start in 20 and probably read to the end of the chapter. What, what chapter? First Corinthians chapter 1. Um, it's, I, I, I really enjoy this first part of Corinthians. You know, Corinthians is near and dear in my heart because of the way Paul sees them in their carnality and their weakness, their foolishness, their immaturity just loves the hell out of him, you know? And he rebukes him super hard, but but he's, you can tell he's so loved, he's just, God, he's in love with them, he loves them, he's proud of them, even though they're, they act like morons a lot, you know? Um, in contrast to the Galatians, right? Who are probably a pretty religious church that look good on the outside. Um, okay, verse 20. Where, where are the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, because, the, because of that it pleased God, through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. The Jews request a sign, Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brothers brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise according to the flesh. Not many of you were mighty. Not many of you were noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. He brings invisible things to destroy all these huge man-made things that are, you know. It's amazing. Why? Verse 29. So that no flesh should glory in his presence. Verse 30. This is my whole goal for you guys today. But of him, or because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us, or became to us, wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory, in the Lord. All right, so um, that that part right there is incredible. Um, back when I first was in religion and I didn't know that I was righteous because of Jesus and I had to get righteousness by living righteously, I used to believe that way. Anybody else used to believe that way? Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember sitting and listening to a preacher preach this passage, and I was starting to get the gospel. And I, I was starting to glimpse it, and I was like, wait, it, it says he became that for us. What does that mean? Sh surely it can't mean what it sounds like it means. You know? Um, yeah, my, my wisdom? What? My, my righteousness? My, my sanctification? Wait, isn't sanctification like... You have to like try really hard to be sanctified and like sanctify yourself and like um, not not sin because then you're not sanctifying yourself and and like anybody else here like the sanctification maturing teaching a lot um, that kind of puts you back in the works. Um, yeah, striving. Yeah, um, redemption. Yeah. Big words, all these words, you could, like, you could just sit and, you know, dive into each one of these words because they're so deep and powerful for the gospel itself. They, they express something so huge about the gospel, the good news of who Jesus is and what he did for us. Um, 
So God's wisdom. So, so Jesus became for you and for me God's wisdom. Amen. So if you're foolish, celebrate because Jesus became your wisdom. <laughs> right? Let the fool say I'm wise. Let the weak say I am strong. strong. Let the poor say I am rich. rich. Right? He, this is how he works. But you're learning to rest in these weak places. You know what I mean? You're learning to rest in, I did not earn any of this. And it's, it confronts the pride of man yeah. constantly. The pride of man says, no, I want to earn it. I want to deserve it. I want to have credit for it. But it doesn't work that way. Amen. Jesus is your wisdom. Jesus is your righteousness. Jesus is your sanctification. Jesus is your redemption. So, um, on, on wisdom, I'm going to... 1 Corinthians 3.18 says this, Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool so that he can become wise. Amen. I, when, you, when you're growing up in the world, you are taught by the world, you must become wise like the world. The world is constantly teaching us, you know? Right. And they're constantly saying, you lack this, you lack that. Come get this, come get that. There's more, more, more you got to get, you got to get, you know. And um, there, was a, there was a period in my life where I, I never captured that verse right there that I just read, 1 Corinthians 3.18, but I was living it. I, I was, all the desires I had to learn of the things of the world just began to like go away. And I, my dad was frustrated with me for a period because he was very strongly of the opinion that I needed to stay in the know in what was going on in politics, what was going on in the world, what was going on in this, that, and the other industry, right? And, uh, and I, didn't, I didn't argue with him, he, you know, I think once or twice, he's like, you're like an ostrich, you know, stick your head in the sand, pretend like nothing's going on. I was like, no, Dad, I, I don't know what it is, but I, I, can't, I can't focus on that stuff right now. I, I can't, there's no life in it. There's no... And I, and I had to, like, I went to school in the world. You know, I went to a military academy. I work in the world. I am exposed constantly to the world. I'm not, I don't live a, you know, a hermit lifestyle. Um, but in my inner man, I had to let go of the world's wisdom. And it, it, after one year, it became two years. And after two years, it became three years. And after, you know, and, and then on year three, I had a friend who left the faith um, and I had missed him for about three years because he, he moved to another base and then he came back. And I met him right in this season of time. And I had a very God-appointed conversation with him. And he was, he was right here in this place where he had sought the world's wisdom with all of his heart. He was so hungry. He wanted to know what, what it was he was made for, you know, and he was, he's, he, he's the kind of guy that would read like two, three books a day without breaking a sweat. You know, his brain was way too big. He was, he, the way he would talk, the way he would, you're just like, oh my gosh, you're like, he's just an intellectual giant, you know? Um, and he, he was avoiding me at work. I didn't know why until I talked to him, but he was avoiding me because he had left the faith. He's like, I don't believe anymore. You know, he's like, I consider myself agnostic. And um, I, I finally, I just was excited to like have lunch with the guy and reconnect, you know, I had no idea. And um, pretty soon we were talking and, and he was crying for like three hours straight in his office. And, and this is all we're talking about is the world's wisdom versus the wisdom of God, you know, and how different it is. And I began to share out of my own testimony, my own heart, like, man, dude, I've had to let go of all that stuff because the tree of knowledge just brings death. And that's all the world has to offer. The world is just going to give you tree of knowledge. It's going to give you judgment. It's going to give you divisiveness. It's going to give you a billion different judgments, and none of them are unified. Yeah. They're all yeah. separated and fragmented, and they're all creating this death and separate life where there's no. It's a false life, you know. It's this strange, weird thing. And and God, God began to open his eyes, and and he he was so hungry for the truth but he didn't know how to get out of that you know he didn't know he had to forsake the wisdom of the world and that he could receive the wisdom he was longing for as a gift man all it takes is humility to receive the wisdom of god 
Jesus Christ is your wisdom. You know, he will give you wisdom for every situation you ever encounter. He'll give you wisdom for every relationship you ever encounter. He'll give you wisdom. He is, he's wisdom, you know? The, 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 all of wisdom I, it, it is in him. There, there's all this wisdom stuff. In the, I mean, lady wisdom, there's all kinds of, there's spirits of wisdom. There's, you know, like all this stuff. But, but all that, all the wisdom is in Christ. And then Christ has been made unto you wisdom. That takes away a lot of excuses. Um, but he's not a harsh God. He's a good father. He's an incredible savior, king, um, bridegroom. You know, He wants to be that wisdom for you. He's not going to lord it over you. He's just waiting for you to ask. He's waiting for your heart to be soft. He's waiting for you to empty the wisdom you think you have. And I say think you have not condescendingly, but I, the world's wisdom, you know, yeah. you think you have it but it's not true. He's waiting for you to empty that so he can be your wisdom. It's a gift. You can't earn it. You can't study it. You can only receive it. God's righteousness, we talk about this one when we talk about grace, right? Because great righteousness is like, it's like the, it's like the, the lifeline of grace. Jesus lived a perfect life for you as you Every day you try to earn anything by being righteous is utter foolishness. And and we need to challenge ourselves in that constantly. We need to like slow down and be like, wait, am I trying to like perform right now? And and I'll I'll break it down because it's it's easier to be like, no, 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 I'm not trying to perform for God, but are we performing for each other? Right. Because remember, if we're performing for our brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, siblings, work, peer, bosses, what who we can see. And what are we doing for God that we can't see? Right. You know, there's a connection. That doesn't mean we don't honor each other. It just means we're not, our works don't determine our value. You know, there's, you are made righteous as a gift. Jesus, he guarded his mind perfectly his whole life. You know, he took everybody captive. <laughs> Anybody have a hard time keeping thoughts captive? <laughs> it's not the easiest thing. Yeah. Well, take heart. Jesus did. And he's become your righteousness. Yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, it brings so much rest when you meditate on these things. These are huge gospel truths. I, wow. Yeah, so I, I think we're pretty good on righteousness. But keep reminding yourselves of righteousness. Don't move on. We, we don't all got righteousness until we're just fully walking just like Jesus walked. So don't don't deceive yourself into thinking, oh yeah, I got righteousness. Move on. I'm just I'm gonna move on because there's other stuff right here. Um, okay, he has become to us God's sanctification. I have um, I have one more book right here on that. Gonna, anybody know who uh, George Banoff is? Yeah. He's a they call him the Joy Apostle. He's he and his wife Winnie. Um, they they minister to. Um, a group of people like in Europe a lot. The uh, what's that group of people called um, that live in like wagons and gypsies? Thank you. Yeah, they, they have a huge heart for gypsies, and they 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 just have incredible stories, signs, wonders, miracles to that group of people, um, and have for many years. And Georgian grew up in communism in Bulgaria, and uh, he he escaped when he was 19, and it's like like he escaped, like they were. He, he secretly escaped. Um, they were locking down all kinds of stuff. He was a musician, and his story is really cool. He has a he has a, a Bethel school on the East Coast by New York. He and his wife do. So those that are in the Bethel like schools and stuff, they go to his school out there. Um, but this guy's always laughing, and so is his wife. And uh, I recently got his book called uh, It's called Joy: God's Secret Weapon for Every Believer. And I, and I wanted to get it because I've seen that guy's life and I heard his voice and I, and I, I look in his eyes and I'm like, oh my God, that guy walks in a level of joy I've not seen almost anywhere. Yeah. Um, and so I trust what he says, you know? And he talks about sanctification. And, um, when I started learning about grace, one of the things I started learning about was sanctification and that I had been lied to about sanctification. <laughs> because the old, the other gospel, you know, that Paul says, be, you know, be doubly cursed if you preach this other gospel, 
says that you need to like be sanctified and grow and mature and perform religiously um, to become right. acceptable, you know? And it, it's, it tickles your ears. Yeah, it, it tickles the flesh. The, the flesh and the, the mere human aspect of our thinking that we grew up with is, is lured into believing such things as you're sanctified by trying harder. You're sanctified by performing well, by, you know, what do you, self-control turns into this self-righteous self-control where it's not a fruit anymore. That one's such a, is that, isn't that elusive? Like, fruit, when you try to just think about self-control, we try to teach it to our kids, you know, but half the time I, I realize I say it as a work. I'm like, use some self-control. You know, and I'm like telling them to stop doing something, but self-control is a fruit of the spirit. Yeah. Grow yeah. a fruit. Like, what? <laughs> That's so unfair, you know? Um, but sanctification is like that. And um, in, in Hebrews 10, there's two verses right here I want to show you with sanctification. Am I long-winded yet? You guys okay? Oh, yeah, so good. You're a good teacher, Bob. Yeah, you're good. Alex, you okay? Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, chapter 10 of Hebrews. Oh, chapter 10 of Hebrews is so. If I could describe it as a meal, it is delicious. It is incredibly delicious. Oh, like this, is, this is where I first started getting the, the revelation of conscience. It was right here, the end of chapter 9, chapter 10. Because it's so clear. Okay. Um, verse 9, 10. I'm going to start with 9 to give you a teeny context. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. This is Jesus the Son talking to Jesus, or the Father. Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. And then commentary on that. He takes away the first, the old covenant, that he may establish the second, the new covenant, or the new testament. And by that will, by that testament, by that covenant, we have been, what? Sanctified. Sanctified means set apart, made holy, separated as a special, special something. Yeah. By that will, by that new covenant, by that work, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Is this a future thing? No, it's a past thing. It's happened. Verse 11. Every priest stands ministering daily, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down and rested at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, which is... The time we're in right now, right? All the enemies of God are being made as a footstool. They're being made into a useful tool. Yeah. A there footstool is useful for something. Yeah. Sure. Put your foot on it. The enemy is going to become useful for something. Yeah. Yeah. You don't kick out the stool, right? You put your feet on it. Yeah. Yes. Verse 14, here's the second one. For by one offering, he has perfected. That's speaking of the conscience. He has perfected our consciences. He's perfected forever those who are sanctified. Some, some versions say being sanctified because the old religious ideas still come back in there. But if you see the being, it's, it's italicized. Being sanctified. Once and for all sanctified. Set apart. We've been set apart by what Jesus did when he offered his body on the cross. Um, I'm going to read something that Georgian wrote that's really sweet. He, he breaks it down in here, um, justification and sanctification being a gift. Just like justification, or being made fair slash righteous, sanctification is received as a gift by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. It's imparted to us through abiding daily in Jesus, through our intimate relationship. It is a gift that grows and expands continuously. 
No longer stressed by the whip of performance or the yoke of legalism, we learn from him how to live in the unforced rhythms of his grace. Quote, it is because of God that you are in union with the Messiah Jesus, who for us has become wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Right? That, that place we were just camping. While most theologians define sanctification as an ongoing process never fully achieved until we wake up one day in heaven, that is not how I see it. Instead, please consider my point of view. Before I read this, I, this was already my point of view for the last probably you know eight years, but I used to have the other point of view most of my life. But he says it very well. Since our sanctification was wrought entirely by God, our own performance had nothing to do with it. On the basis of his finished work, he offers to us the privilege of engaging in a direct, intimate relationship with him, the Holy One. Before that, we could only be guided under the tutorship of the law. But now that we've been set apart in Christ, by faith, we enjoy direct access to God as a father and his promises to us as his children. While our cooperation is necessary, here's our part. To fix our love gaze on him. He's the master at guiding and helping us to grow in his holiness. And what we do comes out of our love response to him. Doesn't that feel good? Talk about good news and great joy. Once I embraced this wonderful revelation and brought me so much freedom, instead of worrying about my perfect performance and everything that is wrong with me, now I'm daily giving myself into the sanctifying hands of the lover of my soul. Some say that this is a process, but in my world, it is a love-trust relationship with my Heavenly Father. Isn't that good? Marriage and friendship are both good examples. What I'm talking about here one grows continually in these relationships. The word process is not a fitting description here, for it means its, its meaning seems impersonal. It would be, for instance, the last word that I would ever choose to describe my, my relationship with my wife. My marriage is a process. <laughs> not a good thing to hear. Our relationship is not a mechanical, impersonal relationship. Our relationship is based on love and trust that grows in our marriage union. The Apostle Paul uses marriage language when describing the finished work of the cross with the keen intent that as believers we see our new identity. We are married to another and now belong to Christ, our heavenly bridegroom. Quote, Therefore, my brothers, you also have been become dead to the law through the body of Christ so that you may, may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. That was Romans 7.4. The moment that a man and woman are pronounced husband and wife on their wedding day, they are, they are a married couple right then and there, 100%. No bridegroom would ever say, we're almost married. It's going to be a gradual process. <laughs> In the same way, we do not get sanctified gradually either. The day the couple says I do is the same day they say goodbye to everyone else. A groom can't slowly wean off his old girlfriends one at a time. Can you imagine him saying to his bride, Honey, I love you, and I want to marry you, but I have to confess that I've got ten other girlfriends, and I can't get rid of them all at once. It will be a process, and it may take a while. <laughs> but if you marry me, and with your emotional support, I'm confident that I can get rid of at least one girlfriend per year. <laughs> In the process, I'll become more and more faithful to you. <laughs> Would anyone consider a marriage proposal like that? Of course not. You would kindly kick such a person to the curb and say, go process yourself with someone else. <laughs> In this verse, Paul gives a picture of sanctification. And this is uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 2. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy because I promised you in marriage to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. It, here's the meaning. It means having been set apart for the one you love. That's sanctification. You're, you're his. I'm his. He's jealous. You know? You look at him and you, you realize that. You recognize that. And all of a sudden you become glorious. That was the thing we were singing about in the beginning. And that's the 2 Corinthians 3.18. Beholding as a mirror the glory of the Lord. You know? You get transformed. We have been honorably married to another. We have been joined to Christ and he to us. 
According to scripture, we're already married to the, res to the resurrected one. Even before the world was made, God had already chosen us to be his through our union with Christ so that we would be holy and without fault before him because of his love, Ephesians 1, 4. That is our identity. We are not just dating and waiting. <laughs> we have already said I do to Jesus and we can produce, produce fruit unto holiness such as healing the sick, feeding the poor, leading the lost to him. We are married to the happy bridegroom daily so we can enjoy love and joy of the Lord as he takes delight in his bride. Isn't that good? Yeah. Sanctification. Don't fall back into old traps with that word. I was, it, was, it was touching on something. There was a truth when we talk about sanctification even back then, but, but the truth that I, I believe we were trying to teach is the maturing. We were, we were trying to describe this thing that happens where we grow up in Christ. And it's good to mature and grow up in Christ, yeah. you know? Um, you need milk, and then you need solid food, and you become a man. And when you're a full man in Christ, you look like him, walk like him, talk like him, you know? Um, but that's not sanctification. That's maturing. Right. And you can't, you, again, you can't tell a five-year-old, stop being five and be ten. That's not going to make him grow, grow up faster. You know, in fact, it does damage when we try to make children grow up faster than they can. When we treat a five-year-old like a 15-year-old, it's messed up. Yeah. You know, so we need to discern where we're at by the Spirit and honor each other. Yeah. Because then the word of life will come and will mature us richly in grace and mercy and truth and wisdom and, and all that good stuff. Because we get matured by the word. We get matured as we humble ourselves. We get matured as we... Spend time with him, looking at him, you know. Okay, last one. Redemption. So redemption is closely tied to forgiveness of sins. Um, it's, it's, it says it in Ephesians and Colossians. It says, um, in him we have redemption, and then it says, comma, forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Um, that was Ephesians and then Colossians, very similar. Um, but... We are redeemed. Being redeemed is so, so, so powerful. It's like, how many here have, have experienced the power of the blood in some form or fashion where you're like, my God, like, yeah, you know, when you start to get a revelation of the blood, like, it does something. Like, enemy stops talking, goes away, like, all of a sudden you're, like, secure and nothing can touch you. Yeah. Like, the power of his blood is something out of this world. Yeah. Well, redemption is like that. It's very tied into his blood. Um... You're redeemed. You are. Uh, so Christ Christ has become to you and to me our redemption, you know. Um, deliverance on account of the ransom price paid from the power of sin. And here's the part that I want to bring to your attention. Um, the consequences of sin. So you're not just redeemed from the power of sin. You're redeemed from the consequences of sin. And that is not widely talked about um, because it's, it gets back into that, that grace thing that scares us because we go, oh God, if you preach that, people are just gonna become lawless, right. you know? Um, but the new nature is not lawless, right. you know? The old nature is, and that's why the old nature had to die. The new nature is trustworthy. The new nature is led by the Spirit. The new nature is humble. The new nature is loving. The new nature is honorable. The new nature is wise. The new nature is patient. The new nature is kind. The new nature is, you know, humble and meek, teachable. So, being God's redeemed one, means that like Jesus is your redemption. He's your payment for the penalty of sin, the consequences of sin. Now, if you break this down into a natural thing and you say, okay, I killed a man, I have to go to prison, um, can the redemption of Jesus touch even that, that place in somebody's life? And the answer is yes, it can. His redemption is so full and so complete, he can even remove the death sentence or the, the life sentence that somebody 
could have or would have, you know, for justly being tried. Like his his redemption trumps man's judgments above and beyond, fills fills the justice and overflows it. So here, here's the challenge for the believer. This, and again, this is not, if you hear this as a mere human, you will, you'll get stumbled. Right. But if you hear this as a new creation in Christ, Empowered. you'll be strengthened. Mm-hmm. Good. His redemption is to, is to be believed in. It, it's, if, you have made, if you've failed, if you have made errors, if you have sinned, if you have whatever, his redemption is for you to cancel out the consequences of your sin because that is fair. It's fair because he paid a price for it that was above and beyond what you actually deserve or owe because of your failure or your transgression or your, you know, your sin. Um, and Christ, Christ has become our redemption. Like it's, I mean, even just saying this, like it, it breaks strongholds. It it shatters mindsets. It, it removes threats and guilt and shame and condemnation because it's true. And it's, it's this truth that will set you free. It's, it's not unfair if you get ransomed or redeemed from the consequences that you deserved before Jesus. When he comes on the scene, he makes it all worth it. He pays the price and the, uh, he... He makes it fair. I don't know how to say it. I mean, and we need new words, you know? Like, he, he overpaid for, the, for, for the, the, all the injustices you deserve, for all your wrongs, all the consequences that you deserve in your life. He overpaid for those. Yeah. And so you're actually due to be blessed. That's the scandal. Yeah. You're supposed to be blessed. And guess what stops you from being more blessed? You. Oh, we're the only ones that stop ourselves from being more blessed, right. and it's it's scandalous. But and it's not he, you know, he's not. I'm not. I'm not trying to say we just all need to be, um, whatever. I don't. Man, you guys, you guys know what I'm getting at. Yeah, man. Holy cow, Jesus. <laughs> The, it's, this is hard to talk about, but you know, like, because you got the flesh, the, the mere human thinking, but then you got the spirit. Right. And to to a to a new creation, you're you're already blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Whether or not it's here or it's hidden or it's going to be revealed, it really doesn't matter to you when you're abiding in Him. But God is a good Father, and He wants to bless the hell out of you. Period. You know, in any culture, in any context where you're at. He wants to bless you, and we stop his blessings constantly because of self-righteousness, self-worth, self, what do I deserve, what do I not deserve? We stop it. But he has so much more. His redemption will cancel out every consequence and will give us what we deserve because of Jesus. And we deserve so much more than we can even comprehend. We, we can't comprehend it. That's what I want to say. We cannot comprehend how much good we deserve because of Jesus. Yeah, right. And it takes courage to press in and begin to believe that we deserve more because of Jesus. It doesn't glorify you, it glorifies God. Yeah, it doesn't glorify you, it glorifies Jesus. Yeah. It's okay to speak that. And it is okay. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's the Matthew 6.33. It's seek his kingdom, seek his righteousness, and everything the world is chasing after, material blessings, clothing, houses, car, whatever, your father knows you need these things. It's his good pleasure to give them to you. Amen. That he wants to bless you. But somehow we've missed all that, silenced it in our self-righteous teachings, and we make it so we can't receive his goodness and his grace for us, and we then strive to earn it and pretend like we're not because we want to be righteous and holy and because right. the church has taught for many years that it's better to be poor, you know? Paul says, I, I know how to be poor, and abound, and I know how to be rich yeah. and abound. We, while we live here on earth, at least, we, we need to know how yeah. to prosper in all ways, in all seasons, in all times, yeah. you know. But he's a good father. Can you get, can anyone here really imagine being in heaven and being poor? Yeah. <laughs> right? It's, it's ludicrous. Being sick, being lacking, right, 
you know? None of that. It's, it, it, there's an over, I mean, for, the streets are painted gold. What? Yeah. Amazing. It's the streets, you walk on it. I mean, but here, gold is, you know, it's so amazing. It's so rare. <laughs> okay, so, so, so I, uh, I, this is my last thought. I just want to wrap this up. The, the, the goodness of God is way, way better than, than, way better than we realize. Way better, way better. And if you think you know a lot of the goodness of God, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and, and declare you don't know nearly as much as you ought to know in a good way. And that's good. The more you don't know, the better it is for you because the more you have coming. The more you do know, the less you have coming. The less of God. You can have as much of God as you want or as little of God as you want. The fear and trembling comes when you receive goodness because you know you don't deserve it. The fear and trembling lets the old man go, lets the new man step out and arise. The new man is unashamed of anything. He says, I've got it all by grace. I have a good father. You can take away all of it. I don't care. My source is in heaven. He gives me everything. If I, if I got all my material stuff taken away today, the righteous man is fully secure knowing that his father can give all and more the next day. But we don't even need those things, you know? We just need him. He, he loves to give us those things because he loves us, because he expresses love through things, just like we love to spoil our kids or we like to give gifts to each other, you know? And they're, they're means to give love and, and meaning in a relationship. Um, and so those, all these material things don't even really matter that much. They're just He just wants to express lavish love to you and to me, and he wants to save a lost world that's run away and said, I don't want you, God, you know, because they're deceived into thinking he's not a good father. But he's so good. He's so good. Um, you got anything else? Yeah. Good. Okay. Let's get communion ready. We'll pray. Um, okay, Dad, um, Jesus, Holy Spirit, Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> um, we love you. We honor you. Thank you for parenting us so well, for meeting us each where we're at. Um, thank you for the, the honor to to live in a country where we can actually read the Bible openly, buy Bibles in stores, and meet together without being persecuted like many other countries in the world do. Um, we're really grateful for that. And it's hard not to take it for granted when we've been born into that, but right now we just want to say thank you. We acknowledge the, the good gift of being here in America. Despite all the crazy stuff that's going on, we're thankful to you um, for putting us here in this time and this place and blessing us so richly. I pray for all of us to have, uh, Father, that you would give us perspective, um, a grateful, um, thankful perspective, that we would begin to, to observe every good gift you've given us, that our eyes would be open to all the goodness, that, that we would be uh, begin to be uh, shocked at how many good things we have in our lives. And we would be become aware to you all the things that we've not been aware of before uh, because of entitlement or um, religious thinking or or whatever. It doesn't matter, Lord. I just pray that, that we would awaken to your goodness. Um, and we ask for courage to believe in your goodness, yeah. to step deeper into your goodness and not to step back, yeah. not to secure for ourselves and in protection against the, this old idea of God that takes rather than gives. Um, show us how to walk, Lord, in this earth, in this world, where we have an extravagant God, um, and the world tries to tries to, to own us and to lord it over us with that that spirit of mammon. We, we thank you that we don't need we don't need anything, but you give us everything. Yeah. We love you. Thank you for loving us first and making us new. And as we do communion right now, Lord. Teach us even in this. Amen? Yeah. Amen. All right, come on up. Um, Shannon and Nora have the bread and the wine. Um, and remember to smile. Smile right now if you can. Challenge yourself to smile. You'll change your whole physiology, and you'll remind yourself that... that it's a happy gospel. 
um, his blood and his body, although it's serious that he died, he did it for the joy set before him. And you're his joy. The joy of the Lord is, is your strength and you are his joy. His blood washes away all your sin, removes the guilt consciousness. His body was broken so that yours could be whole. So that the whole fragmented body could be put back together and remembered. Lift up your expectations to him. Look at Jesus. Acknowledge he's the healer. He's the deliverer. He's the one who prospers you. He's the one who protects you. He's the one who hides you and shelters you. He's the one that lifts your head when you're downcast. He's the one that encourages you and tells you jokes. It is right that we would be happy taking communion. <laughs> it is right. It is good. to receive. All things are possible to those who believe. Jesus, we believe. Holy Spirit, we believe. Dad, we believe. <laughs> you do the impossible. And we step into you and we just uh, we're growing into this place where we are, we are in you and you're in us. We are one. And we love you. Enjoy. Enjoy.